Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Dana White informs Jay Goltz and Stephanie Stuckey that she has begun the process of franchising her hair salons across the country and perhaps the world. Why did she choose to franchise? As she explains, she does have concerns about controlling the culture in franchise locations, but she believes this is her best opportunity to grow. Interestingly, when Stephanie took over Stuckey's in 2019, she bought a franchise business that she says had lost control of its franchisees, which is why she's now moving in the opposite direction. Plus, Stephanie shares a debate that is raging within the company. Should she price her pecan log rolls for the convenience stores she's selling them to now, or for the more upscale outlets she hopes to attract? And Jay gives us an update on that idea for a new business he told us about just two weeks ago. Spoiler alert, this is Jay Goltz we're talking about. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will, if nothing else, let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, which highlights the most important news of the day for business owners and which you can subscribe to at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining us this week are regulars, Jay Goltz, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home. Dana White, who is CEO of Parley Boyd, a chain of hair salons based in Detroit. And Stephanie Stuckey, who is CEO of Stuckey's, the snack and road stop business best known for its pecan log rolls. The episode is titled, Dana White Decides to Franchise Parley Boyd. Before we get started, one of the recurring themes of this podcast is that marketing is hard for smaller businesses. One reason it's hard is that we are all besieged by self-appointed digital marketing gurus who overwhelm us with outlandish promises. On the other hand, there's Steve Krull, co-founder of Be Found Online. A loyal listener to the 21 Hats podcast, Steve understands the business owners who listen to this podcast because he is one. He knows his stuff, but he's also a real person who you can have a real conversation with. And if you tell him I sent you, you can get a free consultation with Steve himself. Just shoot him an email at steve at befoundonline.com to schedule your talk. That's steve at befoundonline.com. Now on to the show. Welcome, Jay, Stephanie, and Dana. I hope you're all doing well. Thanks so much for being here. What's going on with you, Dana? Anything new? Nothing much, Lauren Feldman. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, but good. I'm not convinced. Are you sure there's nothing new with you? Oh man, um, there's a little something new. Well, tell us about it. So, I've made the final decision as to what to do with my winnings from Detroit Demo Day. Interesting. And it's been a long back and forth journey. And I have decided to franchise. Wow. Wow. That's so funny. I'm actually getting, trying to get out of franchising. (laughs) I'm the opposite direction. That's why I wanted you here today, Stephanie. (laughs) Franchising gone wrong. (laughs) We're going to talk about that. But first, uh, tell us, Dana, why? What, What brought you to this decision? So I had decided that it was time to expand. And so... I had looked at going to Chicago. We talked about that. We had an episode. Absolutely. I was going to Chicago um, and had a conversation with my operations manager. And she said, I think Chicago would be an amazing move. But I hope you don't mind me saying I'd like to talk to you. And I said, sure, what's going on? And she said, you know my background. I've worked with the Sports Clips franchise, Great Clips franchise, and Lady Jane's operations. And I said, yep, those are all hair salons. <clears throat> and, and she said, after having worked here for the time that I have, I've never seen anything like your business. And if you don't mind me saying, I think you are perfect for a franchise model. And we really went in depth and had a conversation that inspired me to call up the franchise consultant and just have a basic conversation. What is the state of franchising after COVID, during COVID, what's going on? And we had a very frank conversation and we talked and he pointed me in the right direction to get the information that I needed. Um, and then after that, I you know talked to people, read the reports um, and called him back and said, this is what I'm thinking. 
and this is what I can do. He was like, okay, um, I think it'd be a great idea, but you have to think it's a great idea. So this is, let's get you comfortable with it. My network has stepped up. Ernst & Young has stepped up. Goldman Sachs has stepped up to give me as much information and support that I need to execute this perfectly. Um, I franchise group, I started my process. I'm about two weeks in, in a five month process. And at the end of this process, I will be the first African-American woman beauty franchisor. And we're already starting to talk about subsidiaries in other countries, five other countries. This is the same group of um, the frame, same franchise team that franchise dry bar. And so they've been able to impart their wisdom on what went right with that process, what could have been improved in that process, um, and what makes Paralee Boy different. But I am extremely confident using my resources, the people that I've talked to uh, away from my iFranchise group family, as I like to call them. I told them, yeah, I mean, of course you're going to give me great references. I want to talk to the people who have nothing to do with you that are franchises. And they said, understood. And that's where I leaned on Goldman Sachs and Ernst & Young to put me in touch with their clients who either started franchises or have been in franchising for years. Um, and that was it. We're off and running to the races. It's been a great process so far. Wow. Jay, any questions for Dana? Wow. A uh, lot to take in. Um, the franchise consultant, I mean, I've looked into this a little bit. There's, I don't know, 20 of them. This one, okay, so this one did dry bar. Okay, that's good. Are you privy to what the numbers are from that whole thing? What do you mean the numbers? What, are they making money? Is like How many lawsuits are coming from the people that bought the franchises? Are they First question I asked was about the lawsuit. I've asked not only my, my franchise group, what is the number of their lawsuits, but other franchise ors, and the numbers are low. And I said, okay, but why do you have numbers at all? And they told me why they have numbers at all. And so are there some lawsuits? Yes. But a lot of it has to do with the franchise consulting firm that you start with. No question. There's absolutely no question. And it comes down to being careful who you sell the franchise to. So there is no question that franchising is one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. But with that being said, there's been lots of failures over the years. And I'm glad that it sounds like you did your homework on it. So, okay. Um, wow. Stephanie, how about you? Any questions for Dana? I'm not so sure if it's questions as much as some cautionary tales, although this all sounds great. So I in no way want to dampen this enthusiasm. And I love that you would be or will be the first female African-American franchisor of a beauty salon chain. So I'm all for it. I just have a very different experience. And part of it is that I purchased Stuckey's and we had a franchise system that had really gone awry after years of neglect. So the challenge you have, and you know this, is ensuring consistency and quality and really capturing what's unique and making sure your franchisees get that. And in order to have that, you have to have a strong operations program and systems in place. And we lacked that at Stucky, so we don't have consistency. So I'm trying to do a lot of cleanup. And I looked at Waffle House is a good example for me. They're Georgia-based. I know some of their high-up management and their general counsel in particular has been really helpful to me. And Waffle House had, I think I've got these numbers right, but it's about 70% of their stores were franchised and then they did an about face. And now I think it's to about 90% corporate owned because they were not getting the consistency and the quality in their locations. So they just started buying up the location so they could be in control. Uh, another example, a brand that I really admire is in and out Burger, and they have had repeated efforts investors begging them to franchise and they never have and they have a cult-like following that's just rabid and it's because it is in my opinion in large part and i'm reading a book on in and out so i'm pretty obsessed with in and out right now but they really control everything about that program 
we've had a very different experience and I'm trying to segue to a corporate owned model and looking at how Waffle House did it as our as our guidepost, but you have a very different program and a different product and there's a huge opportunity. You've got great backers. So I can see where it can work for you. This has been my biggest homework, studying those franchise models, understanding why Subway is the way it is, why Chick-fil-A is the way it is, why In-N-Out is the way it is, even though they're not a franchise. My, I was, I was sitting here at home a couple of weeks ago and I literally got into a cold sweat. Why? Because Dana, there's a reason why no African-American hair salons have franchise. Find out what that reason is. And it dawned on me what the reason was. And so I immediately, it was a Sunday evening. Wait, 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 what's the reason? From what I deduced, the reason is because it's extremely individualistic. Extremely. There are no, I mean, the only thing that groups people together are the four walls they work in. And that's it. What the person in the chair is doing next to you has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing in your chair. There's no consistent branding. So I jumped on the phone with the franchise consultant because it was, you know, I said, if I will be closed in five years if I don't find the answer to this. And it is going to be the culture and the training. And I have been obsessed with it for the past two weeks. The operations we have down, even though it can always be improved, and it will be through this process. I have over 100 years of African-American hair tradition to shift and execute on. And if I didn't, I told them, if you all don't understand that, if you all don't get that, this is never going to work. It's not going to work. Listen, I feel better that you have your operations manager. I feel good that this franchise consultant did dry bar and they have experience with that. But this is no slam dunk. I'm not saying fifth. I don't know what the odds are, but I won't be shocked if this thing works great and you become a zillionaire. I won't be shocked if you call us in a year and go, oh, my God, what I get myself into. I... This is... uh, This is not a... The best franchises are turnkey. Like, like hard to screw up. This is not too hard to screw up. Get somebody with a personality problem, get somebody that can't manage. This is, this is very personal. So I don't think it's the ideal franchise as far as being easy, but you know, I could see you could pull it off, but there's a lot of moving parts to this. That's for sure. There's one aspect of Dana's business that maybe we should uh, repeat for people who haven't heard her talk about it before. And that's that, you know, she built her systems on the principles of lean manufacturing. And I'm guessing that's what the franchise people liked and what your operations manager liked in terms of thinking about you as a franchisor. The fact that you have these v- very, uh, you know, strict principles about how everything happens in your business that you did that to make it operate as efficiently as possible. But I assume that converts pretty easily to a, you know, a franchise uh, explanation of, you know, what a franchisee is supposed to do. Yes. And I think to Jay's point, I think it's a matter of who you hire. We ha- we're hiring skilled labor and you have to have a license. So we can't hire a 16 year old to come in and just do the hair the people that we hire are already coming in with a skill set that is, you know, primed and ready to work in this industry. Now, all we have to do is say, this is how we do it here. I would be a lot more nervous if there had never been a salon that had franchised before. There are tons. There are dozens. (laughs) There are dozens. I like the fact that Dry Bar already you know, is out there. And if it is successful, which I presume you've got a number, okay, they already did it. Okay, I... I think that's fair enough. Dana, can you t- you said the consultants uh, talked to you about what worked and what didn't work for Dry Bar. Can you give us uh, a-, a sense of that? Most everything worked, but from what I understand, it did become about the numbers at some point. What do you mean by that? From what I understand, it became, okay, we're selling these things like hotcakes. Let's sell these things like hotcakes. Um, and there was a team of people involved in the process versus with, you know, a team of interest, right? You've got somebody who's interested in the quality, somebody who's interested in the operation, somebody who's interested in the money. 
Um, and then some of those voices were louder than other voices. Whereas in my situation, it's all Dana. And I've made it very clear to everybody I've worked with. We can sell two after, we can award two franchises after my first year, fine with me. I can't be driven by how many units did you award this year? I've made it very clear to the franchise consultants and the people who are helping me outside of that, that my focus is on culture and training. That is it. You can sit in front of me with $20 million. If you are not in line with this mission and vision, right? If you're a hairstylist who wants to come from behind the chair, but cannot become a businesswoman who can run and operate this salon, this is not the franchise for you at all. And I'm not going to be awarding them because you come to the table with a lot of money. You have to be impassioned about solving the problem that we are solving for, the change that we are making. And you have to get it. And a lot of people don't. I was going to ask if you considered the ownership model, like you can have much, multiple locations and you, you own all the locations and then you can totally control the standards and the quality and consistency. Although I do love the idea of you're creating wealth, but you do have more control. And if you've got investors who are willing to support your model. I don't have investors. No, no. Here's the difference. This is the reason why franchising, when it works, it works. It's a difference between having someone owning it and running it or having some rich guy that's on the golf course putting money into it. it it's the, the franchise model works because these people own it and they're working it. And in, in this case, they're financing it. So it's their money. It, it works when it works. Well, and the corporate model works when it works. I mean, it all it all comes down to execution. I mean, that's true of any operation. It comes down to execution and money. My first goal was to do an in and out model, right? Was to have it all owned, company owned. It'll take me forever long to get there. It does take longer. Absolutely. When you look at companies that have been around for 50 years, they got lots of options. In her case, she doesn't want to wait 50 years because she'll be an old lady. So, you know, it, that's the difference. It depends absolutely on what your business model is. If you want to grow slowly and organically, look, Stuckey's has been around since 1937. Hopefully, we're not going anywhere. I think the corporate owned model makes sense for us. That doesn't mean it makes sense for everyone. And I certainly have been studying the different franchise models. Chick-fil-A is a fascinating one. Dana, you brought up that model. It's really not a, a franchise, as you know, because those owners... They call them operators. They're not owners. They, there's no equity in the business. Chick-fil-A owns the real estate. They own the business. And they're simply operators. You're only allowed to own one or operate one store. And then you go wherever Chick-fil-A sends you. Having said that, that, that model works for them. And it, it, it is, is hugely successful. But there are many models out there. In the small giants model, though, it also gets down to what's the definition of working. One could argue, and I do argue this, would you rather own six salons, make $800,000 a year, live in a nice house and have a nice life, or franchise 300, make, I don't know, $3 million a year, but have people calling you, screaming at you at once a week and have a lawyer on staff to take. I mean, it's a different, it's a different animal. It's just different. One's not right. One's not wrong. It's what your goals are. And those are two, two extremes, obviously. Like you can have a franchise. It's a small manageable number. You're still a franchise operation. I think the math is hard to work in a quote unquote small franchise thing. I think there's a critical mass you need to have for it to work. Absolutely. It's a volume business. Franchise is a volume business. I am not interested in the volume business for Stuckey's. No, I think that makes sense. And my partner too. Like it's a shared vision of what we see of creating a unique brand with a rabid loyal following. So that's what we want. Dana, can you talk to us a little bit about the the uh, finances of this? You started this by telling us that you've decided how to use the money from Detroit Demo Day. Uh, I believe you won $200,000. You have told us previously that you've put fifty toward marketing. Are, are you spending the rest on the, the franchise consultant? I am. Well, not just the franchise consultant, but everything that goes with the franchise consultant. So there's legal, there's um, marketing and PR once you get up and running. So they set everything up for you. 
And then you use your remaining dollars to execute on the setup of the marketing. Have you figured out what the package is going to look like, what somebody has to pay you and what you are going to demand they invest in building their location? Yes. So we have, we don't have a hard number right now, but we believe just by my competitors um, or what they're deeming as my competitors, which are other blow dry salons, the franchise fee is anywhere between $35,000 to $45,000 um, to, to start um, to, just for the franchise fee. And then we're, we're, uh, we're thinking that um, you're going to need probably anywhere between 500,000 to maybe 1 million, 1.1 million to open one, depending on where you are, what you decide to do all in, which they're very happy with that number because it's significantly cheaper than other uh, blow dry bar hair salons. Jay, you like starting businesses. Are, are you interested? Not in the slightest. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, Jay no. cannot be a franchisee. No way. I had a question about whether there's going to be a monthly percentage of sales fee assessed in addition to that and, and an allocation towards marketing. Absolutely. There is royalties every month. We're really early, so we don't know what that royalty will be per month. I'm surprised that $200,000 is going to get this boat floated. I'm surprised that after you pay the consultants and the lawyers and the accountants and the marketing materials and the blah, 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 that $200,000 is enough money to prime the pumps on this to where you start getting cash in from people to do this. $200,000 is enough to get the the ball going so we can they can give us everything we need to use the rest of the money to market and market digitally. So it's not like we're going out and buying television ads in all national television ads to market, right? Digital marketing, I have found, has made it more effective and significantly cheaper to get leads when it comes to that. Because I have looked into franchising. I, you know, I had the big, you know, my frame business was growing like crazy. And I thought, oh, gee, I should. So I did talk to some franchise consultants. And it seems to me that they would always tell you, you need to have two or three successful locations to use as a prototype and how's that work and covid i had two locations and they've seen my numbers and have said okay you're doing better than most hair chain salons and i didn't realize that i thought i was doing oh i'm just you know meager sad numbers no they said there are salon hair chains that don't break twenty thousand dollars a month and you do even in a pandemic. And you are offering something very unique in your marketplace, which I think is a, a strong selling point. There isn't one out there. Exactly. And when I was on the phone with Goldman and then, you know, the other people, the women who are in my market screamed. She said, I work at Goldman Sachs. It was yesterday's call. I work at Goldman Sachs. I work 12 hours a day. Do you mean to tell me at seven o'clock in the morning, I could go get my hair done and still be at my desk by 9 a.m.? I said, yes. Or I could come after work and I could just walk in after I get off of a conference call at six o'clock, be to you by seven and be done by 830. Yes. She's like, I don't think you realize what Dana's business is doing. That's why I think there's a very good chance this is going to be a home run because I do think you the market is going to recognize that. And I don't think you could, I don't think you have a choice to grow it organically because I think someone will just jump on it and get some investor money and beat you. You know, they see you have three locations that are working well. Why wouldn't somebody with money just go ahead and change, come up with a different name and do the exact same thing? I think franchising will allow you to get out there faster. And the, the hiccup for that, I was told from the consulting group, is you have to be taught how to manage a walk-in only salon with volume. That's something you have to teach. Um, or, you know, put the systems in place. That takes time. You have to put the systems and the operations in place in order to do it, manage it, and do it successfully for eight years. And so if it were a burger joint, okay, here you go. If it was a coffee shop, here you go. But with thick and curly hair and an operating environment of walk-in only, on Easter Saturday, we had 13 women lined up outside. All of those women were in and out in under two hours from the time they started. And for those that did have a wait because we just didn't have the, the staff volume to get them all in at the same time, we, you know, make it easier for them and they don't mind. But the fact that on the busiest hair day ever, 
for Black women is Easter Saturday, right? And the fact that all of our metrics had everybody in and out in a certain amount of time, the model is solid. My hair traffic controllers do a great job. Um, and now it's time to have a team help me make this, you know, something that we can duplicate nationwide, if not worldwide. And that's it. That's it. That's exciting. No, I, I think I think you can do this, Dana. I really do. I it it, it it all depends on what your business model is and what your what your goals are. And this aligns with the direction which you want to go. I think it's exciting, and you you're offering something incredibly special. Thank you. Dana, I think we understand why you decided to do this. Obviously, you know, there are no guarantees with any decision, um, but it, 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 I think it makes sense to all three of us. Can, can you tell me what, what aspect of this are you most concerned about? I'm most concerned about the, the culture. Will I be able to impart a culture of Parley Boyd in an industry for a market that hasn't changed in over a hundred years. I think what gives me hope is the fact that I won't be doing it alone. And and then there are people out there that do get it. For example, um, on the phone with the franchise consulting group, they get it immediately. Everything is just clicking on so many cylinders. And I got emotional because it was, I felt like that, that puppet in that GE commercial where everybody's yelling at it and throwing food at it, get out of here. And then he went to the one company that said, you know what, come here. They cleaned him up, put him on stage. And he was beautiful. That's how it feels. And you're going to get sued eventually. And that's okay. No, I mean it. It's okay. Yeah. It won't happen a lot and you'll settle it and move on and sell it to someone else and fix it. But you know, that's probably going to happen. I asked the iFranchise group, what is, why are your your legal, your lawsuits, your litigation so low. They said it's all in how we set up the operations. If you are a franchise owner that wants to sell them and walk away, you're not, we probably won't even take you on. And there's more of a challenge when you're looking at a service base versus a product based and Stuckey's is a bit of both, but primarily product and we can control the product that we supply the franchisees. But the service base gets a whole other level of operation. So I, I find franchising absolutely fascinating. Well, I love the fact that you and Dana are going in opposite directions. Um, and as we continue this conversation, I suspect you'll be able to help each other. Absolutely. It's all about your goals. And, and, and there's no right solution. It, it just depends on what, where you want to take your business and your brand. I think so. Obviously, we will be talking a lot about this in the future. Uh, let's. Uh, I want to hit a couple other things uh, in the time that we have left. Uh, Stephanie, I know you've had some uh, pricing issues of late. Tell us about that. Yes, we've been dealing with skew rationalization and pricing. Lots of fun getting down in the weeds issues with Stuckey's. But we are rolling out our new, literally, our pecan log roll is rolling off the lines and we will have our new packaging done. This is the pecan log roll that you're making yourself for the first time in a long time at the factory you recently bought. That's right. After decades of outsourcing our product line, we needed to up our candy game. If, if we're best known for the pecan log roll, which is what we're known for, and we're producing a subpar quality product, then... We need to figure that out. So it's taken me a year and a half to get to this point of I had to get a business partner who knows how to the manufacturing space. And he's moved to Renz, Georgia to manage the candy plant. So here's our dilemma. And I love feedback on this is do we price to our current customer base or do we price to the customer base we want? Because our brand has frankly been cheapened over the years. And we've gotten into more of a C store market where we really want to be more of an upscale gourmet chocolate, which is where I think we belong. Our gourmet candy, a southern confection, quality product. The quality is amazing. It is so much better. So we're making a better product. It's going to cost us slightly more. So it's it may very well cost us out of our current customer if we price it where we need to be making the profit margins that we want to hit. So how do we go about that? Do we continue to make, produce the old product that we're outsourcing as a stopgap for now so we can keep the profit 
flowing. And then we're slowly introducing new markets and we're getting into better channels. And we're getting into more gourmet locations. And as we grow in that more gourmet niche, then do we cut off that C store business or do we ask the C store business, okay, we know you're used to buying that Snickers candy bar for like a buck fifty. Are you gonna pay two ninety nine for a pecan log roll the same size? It's better quality. I think the answer is yes, and I think you should jump. I think you should bring them to where you are. I go to Whole Foods. And I've spent four dollars on a candy bar and just and I loved every bite of it. If you are increasing your quality, increasing your products that go into that pecan log roll, then they should pay for that. I don't think having a transition is a bad idea, but I wouldn't I wouldn't have a long transition. One of the best decisions we ever made was raising our prices because we do offer more now. So for you, if you're offering more better quality chocolate, better quality, then the customer will pay for it. And you'd be surprised at how much they'd be willing to pay. Even your current customers who are paying two bucks will go up or, you know, dollar fifty will go up, especially if there's a, a fair transition. I think a whole, whole Foods customer would would buy at that price. And we actually do have a product line that could do well in Whole Foods. Because we have a whole snack pecan line that's very healthy and all natural. But would a C store customer, will they pull over at a BP gas station on the interstate highway and they've got a stucky section in the store? Will they pay two ninety nine for a pecan log roll when right now they're paying a dollar nineteen? I think so. And I'll tell you why, because they already recognize they already have they already know what they want. Um, they already, you know what I mean? Some may not. I don't think they all will. It's a volume game, right? You can have less customers at a higher price and still hit your marks. Okay. I, I've been very quiet waiting. <laughs> I was waiting for you, Jay. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I have one word. I can tell you the answer. You said the margins you want. This has nothing to do with want. This has, this has to do with need. You need a certain margin, and that's what you got to charge, and that's the way it goes. And and Dana just was correct. Some will pay it, and some won't, and you just answered it. And the fact of the matter is, I can show you the easy math on this. If you raise your prices 30% and you lose 30% of the business, you're way ahead because – you're bringing in the same amount of money, basically, except your cost of goods sold is much less. In this case, my guess is you're going to raise your prices and you're going to lose less than that. It, it, it's it's hard. It's going to be hard to lose money on this deal if the product's better and the packaging looks better. You will absolutely lose some customers. There's no question, but it, it'll be okay. I mean, better to lose a customer for price than lose it because you got bad service because there's not a lot of upside to giving bad service. You're not saving a whole lot on bad service, whereas at least if you lost them for price, you made it up on the other eight people that did pay the price. So you charge what you have to charge. That's the moral of the story. So, and I would transition it over. You can play around with it and see how things are going, but uh, you don't have to like make a decision tomorrow. Uh, you can start it and, and see what happens with those C ones, see where you have to charge to make money and you could, you could slowly transition over, but I'm sure people will pay. I'm sure many people will pay more for a better product. You all know where Stephanie wants to get, where she wants to be eventually. Yes. How do we get there? Getting there could result in a significant short-term loss of revenue. If those C stores just don't place orders uh, and she hasn't lined up her new customers yet, there could be a tough period. How big a problem would that be, Stephanie? It'd be a problem. And we're running projections where we do a 35% margin, where we do 40% margin, we do 50% margin. So we're running the different margin scenarios to see what we can afford to, to manage. And we're also looking at shipping direct from the manufacturing facility versus shipping to our distribution facility, which is going to save us a significant amount. So we're really looking at how we do business overall to provide the best quality product to customers at as fair a price as possible and also upping our our customer game and so i'm actually i do have to solve this somewhat like tomorrow because i'm putting together a proposal for a resort hotel chain that wants to put us in their marketplace and it's somewhat of a it is a captive audience it is 
a thousand beds in a whole resort complex that's walled. And so the people going to that marketplace are going to be paying a premium because of the convenience and they want to put a stucky section in. So we're deciding that price point like now. I can help you with this. I knew the word that was coming out of your mouth. I saw it coming a mile away. I was waiting for you to word, use the F word. I was waiting to hear it to say fair price. I'm here to tell you it doesn't exist. There's only one thing that exists, appropriate price. So if you're selling a beautiful high-end product that is great quality and you're on a resort in the middle of nowhere, they can't, the appropriate price. You're not getting fair. <laughs> Yeah, there's no fear in this. It's appropriate. You're getting appropriate for the marketplace. The appropriate price. I this is what I know this come in the framing industry. These people half the frame shops in the world don't make any money and they run around going, Well, I want to be fair. And I go, Is it fair that you don't make a living? I go, These people are driving up in expensive cars and laughing themselves. You know, oh, you're framing so and you don't even make a living. Is that fair? Forget forget fair, appropriate. I love that. All right. If I take nothing away from this show, but I will take a lot, but I am going to forever say appropriate, not fair. It took me 20 years to figure that out. It's so right. Well, and it's all marketing. It's all marketing because I'm going to pay more for Nike sneakers because I absolutely love Nike and I read Shoe Dog and I think Phil Knight is amazing. And so, and it's a cool brand. And that brand says something to me on a personal level, even if it costs more. Right. So marketing and branding and telling the story of your product is critical to whatever price point you want to set. The other lesson is Orville Redenbacher invented gourmet. He, you know, we're so used to it now. You don't, he invented gourmet popcorn and people said, what? You can buy a two pound bag for, you know, 40 cents. Well, you're going to charge three, whatever the number was. And the answer is it's $3 in your case. The, the 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 pecan roll, it's three dollars instead of a dollar. It's three dollars. No one's gonna have to mortgage their house to buy a three dollars. So yeah, it's three dollars instead of a dollar and a half. It's still three dollars. So that's kind of the issue. No one if somebody wants it, they're gonna pay the three dollars. We are having a raging debate at Stuckies about this, by the way. Just so you know, we're getting the but if I see a Stuckies pecan log roll right next to a Snickers bar, you know, and Snickers bar is a dollar cheaper. I'm like we're not competing with Snickers. We are a Southern confection recipe passed down from my grandmother, although she slightly changed it, since 1937, with pecans that are grown in Georgia and are the freshest, most delicious pecans you're going to find anywhere in the world. You can't find them anywhere else. My newest Jayism is everyone who speaks in absolutes is always wrong. So the person that goes, I wouldn't spend that. Okay, I accept that. But would you, would you, there's, this isn't going to be a hundred, a hundred people walk in, a hundred people aren't going to go, I would never spend, you know, maybe 60, will pay. it's not a black and white thing. Some people will pay it. Some people won't. I don't need a thousand customers. I just need the right one, you know, a hundred of the right ones to go into that convenience store and buy them. Okay. So you guys have been way too interesting today. We're running long. I got one more topic that I got to cover before I let you go. Uh, I think we can do this fairly quickly. Uh, Jay, last time you were on the show, I think a couple weeks ago, you were all excited about the new business you were starting selling art online. Can you tell us, have you made any progress with that? That's an old idea. <laughs> It was two weeks ago. I'm opening a cafe for my home, my home store. Wait, wait, what, what happened to the online art store? Uh, two things. I was having a really good day that day, and then the next day, I started to see what I've been talking about for months. Some there are some people that are on the edge from this a year long COVID thing, and I, I we're like people are stressed out. I had a tense week and I had to take care of that stuff. But also in the meanwhile, because we're opening up again and because there's nowhere to go out to eat right around my place and I've got this beautiful big 6,000 foot lot between my home store and the frame business and I've got plants out there, I'm working now on we're trying to put together a little Jason Cafe thing where they can come in and hang out. And so that's the new idea. So I would say I'm putting it on the back burner for the moment. Jay, make sure you use furniture from Jason Home. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's all part of the magic. They're going to, because they, they come into the store and they go, oh, I love the store. I wish I could live here. I'm telling you, they say that regularly. So we're going to let them live there for a couple hours. And I found the guru of coffee in the city of Chicago. He's extremely into this. And I found the guru of pastries. These are really well-known people. So we're putting together a plan there and I'm going to do that probably. Jay, when you told us two weeks ago about your uh, idea of opening the art store online, you told a little story about talking to an accountant, I believe, who told you yes, <laughs> a tremendous percentage of entrepreneurs make the same mistake. They make a lot of money in their business. No, it was the banker. It was a banker. And then they decide they just have to open a restaurant. Yeah, no, this isn't a restaurant. This is this is this, back to my five things. Um, maybe I'll put 30 grand into it or something. This is not a $300,000 venture and there's no leases and there's no, it's, it's not, it's a small thing. It's celebrating the end of COVID. That's that we want to celebrate for our customers. And I believe it's going to be a big hit. And it, there's not a whole lot of downside. I mean, it just, there just isn't. So how quickly are you thinking you can have this up? It's it's not easy. I'm I'm working on it. We're trying to do it in five six weeks, but I'm not sure I can pull it off. I'm I got some consultants. We're in it. It's you got to get permits. It's 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 a little trickier than it appears as usual. So I'm working on it. So in two weeks, you might tell us you've changed your mind. Oh, I should absolutely have uh, some better input in two weeks. Yeah. My thanks to Jay Gold, Stephanie Stuckey, and Dana White. This was great, guys. As always, thank you for sharing. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>